it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker, uh, Robert Lightfoot, Jr., who is the acting administrator of NASA, a role he added uh, January 20th in addition to his permanent position for the last five years. He uh, does label himself as a rocket scientist. He began his NASA career 28 years ago as a space shuttle main engine test engineer at the Marshall Space Flight Center in 1989. He began, began his aerospace journey with a mechanical engineering degree from the University of Alabama. Among the numerous awards for his work, he has been recognized three times with the Presidential Rank Award for Distinguished Executives, the highest honor attainable for federal government work. We are very honored to hear his talk this morning, to, to draw him out of Washington, D.C. He'll be speaking on NASA 2018 and beyond, an integrated view of NASA's work to make the next giant leaps in exploration. So, uh, Dr. Lockford. Well, good morning. Wow. <laughs> wow. Do I got to do better than that? Uh, good morning. All right, thank you. <clears throat> I really appreciate the invite to speak. Um, it, it, it's no secret that, that Texas is an amazing aerospace state. Um, you're part of our, just the basic fabric of what we do uh, in the agency, and we depend on the innovation and, and really the incredible education system. An education system that I'm becoming a little more familiar with um, probably my, one of my best friends in the world and my former deputy, Lisa Rowe. Where are you, Lisa? Where are you sitting over there somewhere? Raise your hand, Lisa, so everybody knows. If you don't know Lisa, she doesn't work for NASA anymore. She uh, is now the chancellor at the University of North Texas. And so I'm really happy to see her here. Um, to be, and, and you guys, as part of Texas, have no idea what, what a treasure you've gotten as part of your education system. So I hope you guys will all say hi to, to Lisa while you're here. Um, and she, can, she could probably come give this speech what she knows and what she did as my deputy. So um, it's good to see her here this week. And she's telling me all about what's going on in the education system in Texas, and it's very exciting, right? Because this is, you guys are preparing that next generation workforce that we need um, to, to do the kind of things that we're gonna do long past the time that I'm here and the time that the folks that are here today are, are doing. I think that um, <clears throat> it, it, for me, you just have to acknowledge the passing of John Young, one of our heroes, um, and one of, one of my heroes personally, um, you know, our thoughts and prayers are with Susie and the family um, this week. Uh, it, it was just, that's, that's tough news for us, and he's just been a, a great person um, for our team here at NASA. I also want to thank Ellen Ochoa, our center director at Johnson, for her hard work and dedication. You know, Ellen's been in the trenches with you guys for a long time, um, and, and she knows what we need to get done, and she takes care of getting it done for us. And so I really appreciate her and the workforce at Johnson that never fails, in my opinion, to, to excel and, and, and you know, give them a shout out. You're gonna hear from a lot of them uh, over the next day and a half. Um, and I think you're gonna see some great things that they're doing um, to push us forward um, as, at, from an agency perspective. I'm really glad that this year's focus is on uh, aerospace. There's a lot going on. It's a very exciting time for us, not only, here, not only in the agency, but frankly, as a nation. Um, you know, NASA, we're not the only ones carrying the aerospace banner, but, but we do have a lot going on. Um, and, and we're competing. It's a competitive environment with the rest of the world. It's become a very much a global endeavor, and how are we as a nation going to stay uh, ahead of that global challenge that we've got um, going forward? And I'm not going to get too far down in the weeds, because like I said, you're going to hear from a lot of people about the details that, that go on, but I do want to convey to you that, that we're pushing. We're pushing further, and we've got a good plan going forward, and, I, and, I, and I'll talk a little bit about that. <clears throat> it's really kind of a watershed time for us when you think about it. The combination of commercial space and government space is actually um, really coming to fruition here. Um, if you think about what we've, been, what we've done, there's a broad consensus now in the nation about this is the way we should do this with public-private partnerships moving forward and the things that we can go do. We are venturing back to the moon. The president has asked us to, to go to the moon with the horizon goal of Mars. Um, and that's no, that's no easy challenge, right? Um, but we think we've got the technology improvement to maybe go there and, and hopefully stay um, and then keep pressing toward, toward Mars. We have, uh, uh, you know, been making a lot of progress on that for a long time um, with the Space Launch System and Orion and the commercial partners coming along. It's, a, it's an exciting time for us. And you think about just the involvement of Texas in that, in that whole 
picture, right? You can go from Brownsville to Van Horn. Talk about east to west, across the state, and many places in between, and you can see where Texas is involved and in, in, in what, what we're trying to do and what we're trying to pull off. The Orion spacecraft continues to get put together. That their testing goes fine. Working in Utah, Arizona, it's a nation, nationwide ac uh, activity. Down at Kennedy Space Center, you can see the, the module coming together. It's, it's pretty exciting. Um, we were very excited to get to show Vice President Pence um, the progress being made there uh, a few months ago. And, and that interest level from the administration is what actually turned, turned the space policy directive that we got you know, a couple of weeks ago to go back to the moon and, and understand what we can do there in, a, in, in, in the way that we're going to do it. You look at commercial space and the groundwork that they're doing um, to get crews back to orbit, already doing cargo for us uh, to the International Space Station and doing a great job providing that for us. And I don't think there's any stopping commercial, commercial space now. Um, our partners have, been, have, been, have really reinvigorated America's launch industry. Um, and, and, and that work is developing a robust market um, in commercial space that's not solely dependent on NASA. Um, and I think that's an exciting, exciting thing for us. Last year, we had five contracted cargo supply missions um, to the International Space Station from SpaceX and, and uh, Orbital, ATK, with more coming up from Sierra Nevada and their Dream Chaser in the next set of contracts that we have going forward. And these aren't just simple trips that go up. They're taking, they're taking instruments for our science and research. They're taking supplies we need to continue to run the station. I mean, they are a critical part of our infrastructure going forward. CubeSats, technology dem demonstrations. Um, I think Kate Rubin's going to tell you about sequencing DNA and the stuff that she took up when, when she was on orbit um, this past year. So these, these, these commercial missions that we're doing um, and this commercial industry that we're bringing in to help us with this is really changing the dynamic and changing the opportunity space as well, right? It's not just us that you come to. It's, it's, the, it's the, those folks that go, that they can, they can help you do it. And this aerospace field continues to grow. Look at Blue Origins, look at what, they're, what you see there, look at what you see with uh, Bob Bigelow, and the kind of things that you're seeing just continue to grow from us having an international space station that they can go to and utilize and, and really move forward. And what does that mean to you here in Texas? And how do you, how do you utilize that and take that as an opportunity um, going forward? A lot of, lot of, lot of fascinating times there. So, <clears throat> so, you know, we're embracing that as an agency. We think that's critical to us. Um, the public-private partnerships, how we go do that, what can we turn over. We, we have a strategy that we talk about lead, collaborate, and leverage. There's things that NASA needs to probably lead, and they're the things that are out there a little further that we can, that we can go do, and we can pass on to the industry to take, a, take up the mantle. There's places where we can collaborate, public-private partnerships and things that we can do, but there's other things where we can leverage. Maybe we get out of things that we've been doing and pass it on to let the industry folks take that on. And that's where you guys can pay attention is how we're doing that and help us, help us with that um, as we go forward. So it's, it's exciting. Um, ISS continues to do <coughs> more and more of the commercial type activities. Um, our partners at CASIS are, are doing a great job in terms of bringing more to the International Space Station, using that platform not only just for human research but also for the science activities. Our science mission director just started using the International Space Station in ways they didn't anticipate before. Um, they're bringing instruments up just about every time, and we're, we're installing those on the station and, and bringing back critical, typically earth science data that we need going forward. And you hear, you hear some other things going as well. The, the Bigelow Expendable Activity Module, Expandable Activity Module Beam is what you've heard of. has been up there over a year now, um, and we, we just said we're going to continue doing that, and we're learning more and more about how, how an expandable habitat can survive in, in, the, in the environment of space. We've accepted a proposal from Nanorax to develop uh, the first commercially funded airlock um, on the space station. Um, and this is, again, a step in creating a new economy. Nanorax brings things up to the station all the time that we, that we use, where they bring people to that from a technology development and then a, a design capability from an agency standpoint. So again, this business of ex exploring is pretty strong right now. Um, and I think it's just, it's just increasing even more and more. And this administration's push for us to, to keep pressing in low Earth orbit and really commercializing low Earth orbit, but also moving out into the area around the moon and on the moon is going to be something that we pay attention to over the next four or five years. Our currency, though, while we've got a lot of resources and we get a, we get a lot of, uh, of, of support in that arena, our real currency is inspiration. 
And the inspiration that NASA brings, I think, is what we really pull on to get that next generation in here to help us do these things. And that's the part that is really important to me. Um, how do we get these people involved in what we're doing? If we don't have strong STEM programs, strong activities <clears throat> that we need to do as an agency, you know, we're going to be in trouble. And I think that's something that, that this group is focusing on, and that's why I applaud you for, for focusing on that. And you see the universities that were listed. You guys are providing that next set of workforce that's going to allow us to do what we need to do going forward. Think about aeronautics. We don't talk a lot about aeronautics. Sometimes we, we forget that first day in NASA. Um, and yet, look at what we're doing with Bell Helicopter. Look at what we're doing with the, the, the folks in, in uh, DFW with the air traffic management activities. NASA's involved in all that. What are we going to do about urban air mobility? You know, I, I, I laugh because I want my Jetson car. Those of you that know who the Jetsons are, remember the little car you could fly around in. That's what I want. I live in Washington, D.C. I'd love to be above the traffic and move around. And, but, we're, but people are working on that. You start going to these conferences now and you begin to see the little two-person pods. Uber is already talking about, hey, what's going to be my next version of Uber, right? It's going to be air mobility. NASA's involved in all that and the traffic management around that. That's another big field and Texas is, again, right in the middle of, of what we're doing there. So, so it's exciting and, and people get the enthusiasm. When I go to speak and I get to see, um, meet with the the... I'll, I call them kids, they get mad at me because they're not kids, but everybody's a kid to me these days. Uh, they, you, you get to talk, see the enthusiasm and what they want to do and how they want to contribute. And what we're doing these days, if you think about all the grants and all the things that are going on, where we're engaging high school kids. Um, and even, we, we just flew our first CubeSat from an elementary school, right? Now think about that. I don't know what y'all were doing in elementary school. I was not doing CubeSats. I was worried about whether my crayons were sharp or not, right? That's about the extent of it. But think about what that, what that means when these people enter the workforce. It's a totally different level of, of, an, of, of understanding of what we're trying to do. They are ready to enter the workforce. We, as that, that older generation, have to be able to accept that and let them go to work quickly. Can't be, I, mean, I can remember people telling me early in my career, you know, you really need to, do, you need to sit here for five years before we're gonna give you anything, all right? Now we've got a workforce that's coming and is thirsty hungry, they really want to go make, solve these challenges, and they're more prepared than we ever were when we came on board. So it's an exciting time to see that, um, the kind of big things that we're, that we're trying to do, and the workforce we're going to need to go do that. And I think, so, so if you think about us pushing back toward the moon from a human exploration perspective, think about the science we can do there, not just the human exploration part, the science that's going to come out of that. It's a very exciting opportunity for us. You'll see some of the things we're going to do when we roll the budget out um, here, in a, here in a month or so. Um, what those plans are going to look like um, as we go forward. But we always want to have that horizon goal of going to, to Mars as well. So, again, <clears throat> very exciting time for us. I think uh, you guys are preparing that. Preparing that workforce is what you ought to be thinking about. And how are you doing to retain that workforce? When they, uh, those students, when they get into your schools, are you retaining them? Are you weeding them out? Right? What are we trying to do to keep, get them there so they stay in? And that, that workforce needs to be, or that student population that comes to join us has to be diverse as well. They gotta represent the, the, the rest of this country if we're gonna keep doing that. So I think, I think our future's bright from an agency perspective in human exploration. Using the International Space Station as our jumping off point, we'll use it while we can to develop all the things we need to do for humans, what's happening to the human body, those kind of things, but also develop the technologies that are gonna allow us to progress even further. We'll move to the moon, we'll, we'll work around the moon over the next decade, and then hopefully we'll ultimately go toward Mars in the future. That's pretty exciting. Not, not, not little steps, these are big steps for us as, as we move forward um, in, in the human exploration arena. And I think the thing for all of you to remember is, <clears throat> what I talked about there is not easy, yet these teams do it every day. The International Space Station is this operating laboratory on orbit and the teams make decisions every day that deal with, that, that have risk, they have risk associated with it. But they manage it and they manage it well. Sometimes we take that for granted and I don't think we think about how hard that is. And that's part of the, what we gotta teach people. You learn from your failures, you get better, and you keep going on. And I think hopefully <clears throat> we won't ever take it for granted that we get to do what we get to do. And you guys will be part of that, part of that discussion going forward. We wanna make civilization level impacts. 
when Neil and Buzz walked on the moon, if you think about that, you go back to 1969, if you look at the, above the fold, they had newspapers back then, above the fold, uh, headlines, they almost all said, we did it, no matter where it was in the, in the world. It won NASA, it won the US, it was we did it. That's what we want to be part of. Think about the day that we, walk, that we go back to the moon. Think about the day we land on Mars. Think about the day one of our science missions finds life somewhere else. Civilization level impacts. All those are gonna come right through Texas. Texas is gonna be part of that discussion for everything we do. There's a tremendous workforce here available to us to help us solve those problems. There's a tremendous education system that will help us get the workforce ready to help us solve those challenges. And we, can, we won't be limited by any of that as long as we stay focused on it. So exciting times for us, exciting times for Texas, encouraged by what you guys are talking about here. When I look at the panels that you're gonna have, you're really hitting on the issues that we're worried about in the agency. Not just the technical issues of trying to make these challenges, but where's that next generation gonna come from to support us? So again, thank you for having me this morning. I think I've got time to take some questions. Um, is what they asked me to do. So thanks again for your time and I look forward to your questions. It's hard to see. Oh, go ahead. The question was, where do I see the robotic exploration portion of NASA fitting into the uh, it's a solar, solar system exploration? We continue to have a tremendous portfolio in science. Um, if you look at what we're doing, um, we've now been to every every planet in our solar system. Um, I'll probably break some rule here, but I still consider Pluto a planet because, <laughs> because my teacher said it was, you know, my very excellent mother just served us. Anyway, the pizza part at the end was Pluto. Anyway, I like pizza. So, but we've been to all the we've been to all the uh, all the planets now, and um, we continue that exploration. If you look at what we're going to do, what, what would Juno is doing today at Jupiter? Um, we, just select, we just selected a couple of missions. One's going to go to Titan. Um, or has potential to go to Titan, which is a moon. We're going to do Europa. Europa, we think, is a very interesting opportunity for us. Um, there's, there's some potential for life, and maybe not the form we think of life, but potential for life there, but still the geysers we've been seeing from Hubble. Um, so we're designing that mission. Very complex missions. These are not easy missions anymore. Cassini just finished uh, its great mission with Saturn. Um, we're... we're we're studying our own sun, which is clearly part of our, our solar system. The polar, Parker Solar Probe is going to fly just this year. Um, so, so there's a lot going on. We're going to send insight to Mars this year. So our planetary, our robotic exploration is important. I kind of consider our robotic exploration our scouts. You know, this is scout program. We're going to send, send folks uh, or send these robotic probes. They're going to tell us things that are going to help us when we bring humans. If you look at um, Mars 2020, which is the next rover that's going to go to Mars, similar to Curiosity, built kind of off the Curiosity frame. We actually have a, uh, um, a, a measurement on there called MOXIE. And MOXIE is going to pull out of the atmosphere of Mars and see if we can create oxygen. So it's, again, we don't need that for science, but we will need that if we're ever going to take humans to Mars. So that's the kind of stuff we're doing. I think the planetary programs, or the, 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 the work we're doing in science is very robust right now and has a, has a tremendous opportunity. Those are, I mean, for me, right, as an engineer, those are the things where I kind of turn into the, to the hobbyist, right? I just love the images we get. I just love the discoveries our teams make from that standpoint, and we'll continue to do that. And the moon now will be a, a, probably a stronger part of that in terms of what we learn there. Oop, there we go. I don't know if it's on, but just, just yell. So, so I got a minute and 45 seconds left. Um, so so I, I think the timeline, we're, we're probably, from, from a perspective of, of now pivoting back to go really develop what we're gonna do around the moon, the timeline is, 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 it won't be any earlier than the mid 2030s from that standpoint, but we're gonna focus on getting the technologies ready. 
there's several several challenges. They're all pretty well known. Um, the the entry descent and landing there uh, is going to be a challenge for us. Um, to, that, to date, we've only landed basically one metric ton on the surface there, and you take humans, it's going to be a little bit more than that. So those technologies have to be developed. The radiation protection for the crews um, during that transit, and then making sure the crews have the capability once we get there to to be able to function, and then frankly getting back off the surface of Mars to come home. Are going to be the, I mean, that's the ones that pop into my head, um, but there's more than that. You know, if you saw the movie The Martian, um, it was a really great movie, I thought, and if you hadn't seen it, I don't want to spoiler alert, but when it starts out, they already have all that infrastructure there, and I'm like, that's not fair, right? Because <laughs> we, we, we have to put all that, we have to get all that there, but it's a very similar challenge, is getting, making sure we've got the infrastructure there to support support the, uh, the humans. But those are the big ones to me um, as, we, as we look going forward. In, environmental control and life support systems are going to be a challenge. Today, if you look what we do on station, they don't last long enough for us to go to, to take a Mars trip today. So working on, on that particular piece, um, that's what we're using the station for. I mean, the station has been a great opportunity for us to, to test those. Maybe one more? You good? Oh, Buzz. Yeah, so we're, we're looking at, one of the things we're trying to do is wh what can we pull from, from the moon, right? We, we wonder if there's ice there that we can use and then use for potential propellant, right, for, for future use. So we, we have part, you, you'll see in our, in our budget proposal, we're looking at what we can do scientifically from the moon as precursor missions against scout missions going forward. So we're still working on those missions and what they might be. Um, going forward and I think I think you'll see that that there's a couple of opportunities there not just not just from the prospecting of the of the potential hydrogen and oxygen we can get from the water but also the scientific value of can we get in those what, what's what's in those craters and what's down in there so um, they're not going to be as easy we think to get in there part of it is just saying can we even get there first right and then we'll worry about mining out of there so it's part of our plan that for sure well look thank you guys very much I appreciate your time and good luck with the rest of the conference Thank you.